I direct the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma here at Columbia Journalism School. Um, I want to welcome you to this actually historic conversation. Uh, we've all witnessed over the last few months the degree, the unprecedented degree of threat to which freelance journalists, uh, both international and local, uh, are working under. And in response, something unprecedented has happened. A coalition, a group, a network of news organizations, uh, freelance journalism associations, uh, semi-academics like me, uh, and others have come together to establish new guidelines, principles, for the safety of freelancers operating on dangerous assignments around the world. We'll be hearing a lot about those guidelines. We'll be hearing a lot about the issues that led to them and that are raised by them, and where the community of journalists operating on dangerous assignments is going to go from here. Before we do that, I want to uh, turn the microphone over to my colleague and boss, Steve Hall, who's the Dean of Journalism School. Uh, thanks, Bruce. Uh, you, have, you have no boss, but uh, I'm happy to be your colleague. I, I just wanted to uh, say a few words of welcome and also um, add my voice to Bruce's spirit of congratulations to the people involved in putting this together. Uh, I think there's a lot of reporters here, a lot of colleagues, a lot of foreign correspondents. We've all um, you know, been through a lot with colleagues uh, over a long period of years in different settings. and. I think we all know the obstacles to kind of spontaneous collaboration in our profession sometimes, whether they're institutional or they're just time and focus. Uh, and this is really rare, I think, in our experience that a crisis has given rise to a kind of bottom-up response that has included some of the most important news organizations in the world, and he and Reuters in particular at the Beeb and others that have done something uh, a little bit outside of their own sort of uh, lines by signing on to corporate responsibility principles early before others were s establishing momentum. And I just want to recognize, you know, if you look at the corporate responsibility movement in other industries, the first movers are the bravest ones and the ones that really set things in motion. <laughs> and then on the civil society side, the Charlie and David and others who through their own volunteering and their own time and their own selflessness in figuring out what this should be, you know, helped also to bring this uh, forward. And so we're really proud just to provide the real estate and the food and, and soft drinks. And that's really, um, and now we want to see where this goes and help you in whatever way we can because I think we all also recognize that, that journalism is in a period of de-institutionalization. And certainly around this school, with all these wonderful young people who turn up against uh, you know, all of the uh, conventional advice from, a, uh, from, from some of their uh, bosses and mentors, committed to a life in journalism. And, and the world they're going to go into requires them to navigate uh, on their own to a greater degree than my generation had to do at a comparable age. And so it's a very important service of ours to try to help you help uh, them have the resources and the training and the support they require to do the work that's so essential and that we've all uh, been so uh, motivated by over so many years. So please, as a practical matter, if there's anything that we at Columbia can do to help in a more purposeful or more uh, successful way than we're doing now, please let us know because we really think this is uh, important work and most of all, we're really glad you're doing it. So, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, it is really an extraordinary thing for a school to kind of turn its resources over to convening a, a reform effort that it doesn't control and doesn't have any uh, any investment in beyond making the world a better place. Steve has been supportive of this since the beginning. Um, quick house, housekeeping, quick word on the structure of this evening. Housekeeping, the bathrooms if you need them are one flight down stairs. Uh, there are copies of the call for global standards of journalist safety as well as the press release for this event 
on the table in back, or Kelly, my colleague Kelly Boyce is holding up her hand, she's got them. Um, we are going to have two panels tonight. The, these guidelines that we're announcing draw on complex issues and lead in complex directions and involve news executives, grassroots leaders in journalism, and many others. So we've got a, a big agenda and a short space to do it in. So we've got two panels. The first panel will introduce these new guidelines to all of you. It will be chaired by my friend Emma Daly, uh, one of the great conflict correspondents of the last generation and currently with Human Rights Watch. Uh, it will include Vaughn Smith, who helped draft these, the three people who helped draft these guidelines. Vaughn Smith, uh, founder of the Frontline Club and chair of Frontline Freelance Register in London. Charlie Sennett from Global Post and uh, the Ground Truth Project. David Rode from Reuters. Uh, and Marcus Mabry is the president of the Overseas Press Club. I am going to turn it, oh, no, no, no. Rob's later. Oh, 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 John, sorry, and John, Don Janjewski from the Associated Press, all central to the drafting of these guidelines. Emma, yours. Panelists. Well, thank you, Bruce, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, you know, as Steve uh, touched on in his introduction, it's quite unusual to have a document or a group that involves some of the great media competitors uh, of our time. Uh, we have Reuters and the AP together on this panel. Uh, Agence France Presse is also part of this initiative. And this group brings together media organizations and the freelancers who work for them so often in, in dangerous places. So maybe just to start off, um, David, how did we get to this place? Why are we here? Um, can everyone hear me just with this mic? Or, I guess? Yeah. Take this one? Take, we'll pick up the ah, wire mic. Sorry. Simple idea. Thank you, Emma. Um, before I start, I just want to take one minute um, to recognize a person who's here in the audience. Um, here uh, in the front row in the red sweater is Diane Foley. Um, she is here as a representative of, the, representative of the newly founded James W. Foley uh, Legacy Foundation. Um, it's a foundation that has uh, many things it wants to achieve, but one of its primary goals is to help freelancers um, get the resources and training and pay and support they need. So I just wanted to introduce Diane and thank her already for the work she's doing in this field. Uh, in terms of how this uh, started, I'll try to keep it um, short. Um, the initial thing was actually an invitation from John Danishevsky of AP to moderate a conversation. Um, it was the foreign editors uh, circle meeting. It was about 15 foreign editors at a, uh, a joint uh, AP managing editors and IPI meeting in Chicago in September. Um, and that very same week, there was also, uh, by chance, um, a meeting at Reuters um, hosted by uh, my boss, um, Steve Adler, the editor-in-chief of Reuters. Um, and the theme I want to point out is that those two efforts occurred on their own. And I want to say at the outset, there are, there are other efforts. There's other responses by other organizations uh, news organizations, uh, press advocacy groups, by freelancers themselves to deal with the safety crisis we face. In no way are these guidelines exclusively ours. In no way is this the only effort um, to help freelancers. And we have some initial signatories tonight. We're very proud of them um, and these organizations. But organizations, news organizations, freelancer advocacy groups, uh, journalistic groups are absolutely welcome to sign on to these guidelines at any point. This is an open sort of living document is a, is a term Charlie likes to use. And we're, we, we, if we haven't included anyone, we apologize. It was unintentional and we're eager to include as many people as possible. Um, quickly, we had these two meetings in, in September that I mentioned and there was talk of, well, what do we do? Um, and eventually it came around to try to set up a sort of basic set of guidelines, a sort of rules of the road of how can uh, freelancers <clears throat> and news organizations work together. Um, after the first two meetings, uh, Marcus, who's sitting next to me of the Overseas Press Club, 
hosted a meeting at the New York Times where we met again and uh, formed a, a sort of drafting committee. It was all very informal and volunteer. Uh, and then later that afternoon, we actually came up to Columbia. Uh, Bruce was there and met in Steve Call's office and, and were off to the races. Uh, Juan Smith uh, from the Frontline Free Reg Register was actually also there in October. And, um, you know, we started a process, and I'll be honest, a process that most of us thought would never work. <laughs> And it's an absolute miracle uh, from our perspective that we're here today. And I just thank everyone uh, that's made this happen from all these different organizations. And um, thank you all for coming tonight. And Charlie from, Glo from Ground Truth Project, formerly of Global Post and a founder of Global Post. Do you want to jump in as well on, sure. on this? Um, I think the question was, where did this all start? Um, can, can you hear me? Is that good? Good? So uh, I would just say, I think for everyone in this room, and I, and I know on this panel, the starting point depends completely on how many friends you've lost in the field. It could have started with Rory Peck, it could have started with Marie Colvin, Tim Hetherington, Anthony Shadid, and those, all of those people are friends of these panelists. And so I think the starting point's been this long process of seeing a lot of friends and colleagues so many of them being local journalists from Iraq, from Afghanistan, from places where we work and we've really gotten to know them, but in a really deeply emotional way. For, I think this process really hit a turning point when, when we lost Jim Foley. Jim was working with Global Post. Uh, he was an incredible talent. Um, Nicole worked with him in the field. A lot of you may have known him or you certainly know his story. He had the spirit of what we call ground truth and what is really about you know, like the importance of being there. And the way um, it went down with, with Jim's uh, first capture and then murder, to me it was a global turning point. And sometimes you need these events to really begin to um, turn your heart, or turn your mind toward what we need to do. And I think it woke us all up that the peril is rising so greatly out in the field for journalists that we need to coordinate and confront that peril. And the most extraordinary thing about the last few months has been the way we've seen these organizations coordinate. Everyone has been so quick to, to collaborate and to discuss and to try to really think this through and to try to really find out how do we set these standards. Um, so I think a lot of that, from my own point of view, has to do with Jim's spirit. Diane, Jim was amazing. He was such a team builder. He was such a person of um, like a warm heart and I think his spirit is all like through this process about you know we're going to really um, work together we're going to try to do the best we can because we love this work and it's really important work and it's getting more and more dangerous out there and as news organizations rely more and more on freelancers we're going to have to bind together in a community that cares about this and think it through together in a way that we really hold tight and I think that's the origin. And Thank you. And in the spirit of Jim, who would have asked the question. Yeah. So we now have 25 signatories, including a number of major media organizations. The document is full of a lot of shoulds. We should do this, freelancers should do that, the news organizations should do this. So does that mean that the AP and other signatories will do these things? Or is it you know, more of a, we hope to be able to at some point in the future? Well, we view these. Uh these uh, as a group of standards and principles that we are trying to abide by already at AP. Uh, some of the underlying values are if you send someone on, out on an assignment, you're responsible for that person, whether that person is a local journalist, an international freelancer, or a full staff member. We have tried very hard to, to uh, provide uh, training, uh, medical evacuation, body armor for anyone who goes in the way of danger to bring back the news that we all need. So we see these as ideals that we have a responsibility within our own organization to implement and to live by. And we realize that by writing it down on paper, we're, we're uh, we're saying we think these are the best practices and, uh, and others may hold us accountable, but first we would hold ourselves accountable. 
Um, I want to pick up on a couple of things in there, but I also want Vaughan to bring you in because you're really the voice of the freelancer uh, on this panel, and it's, uh, it's quite unusual to have both the news organizations and the freelancers uh, committing to this. So, um, you know, do you feel happy with what you've got? Is this, you know, is this going to make a real difference in the lives of freelancers, do you think? I think the process... I think this process is extremely exciting. Um, and uh, I think that we've got this far for several reasons. Uh, and remember, we've been talking about these things for decades. Um, I think the key thing in this instance, or one of the very key things, is that there's proper freelance participation and representation in this process, and that has never been before. And I think that completely transforms it. And I hope that from now on we won't be talking about freelancers without talking with freelancers, because uh, we haven't done it before. Um, and I think that's a very good thing. Um, so I, 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 I think that's certainly going to help us. But I, can I just pick up on the point you, 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 you mentioned, Emma, about uh, Seven, the uh, wonderful photographic agency, um, have raised this point about there are quite a lot of shoulds in it. Um, now, my view and the FFR view has been that and we have not got everything we wanted out of this process. It's been a negotiation. We've been negotiating for freelancers. That's nearly 50% of the negotiation. Uh, as one organization, we've been doing all of that. Um, and all the other media organizations have had adding their little bit in, and we tried to maintain enough in there for freelancers for it to be worth us to sign in. We took the view collectively. Um, I'm, I'm part of a board of seven freelancers. Um, and we all decided, it was unanimous, that we should sign this. And we are concerned about the shoulds. There's a hair's breadth of difference between us and Seven. Um, and we completely respect their position on this. Um, they are right. Um, should is too weak. We would like that changed in time. However, it's still a good agreement. It's still important because actually should is a word um, that you can hold people to account to. Perhaps not as much as will, but it's still a useful word. And Marcus, just following up on the freelance issue, I mean, John talked about um, people on assignment, and a lot of the document talks about freelancers on assignment, but of course that's not, you know, the only or even possibly the most common way uh, in which freelancers work for media organizations. Does this, are these guidelines going to help, um, do you think, those situations where there isn't such a a, a close-knit relationship, or is it really more important to focus on ensuring that the freelancers who do have a, a, a already a strong working relationship actually get the benefits extended to staff? Um, those are the most important questions, I think. Um, it's really important to hold two perhaps um, seemingly contradictory thoughts in mind about these guidelines and the process that we went through the very hard process we went through to make them happen, to come to fruition. Uh, the first thought you have to keep in mind, and, and, and everyone's hit, hit on this, and Vaughn talked about it, is this has never, ever happened before. Never before have news organizations, uh, journalism advocacy groups, come together and said, here are a set of principles of how the relationship should go between freelancers and news organizations. That's never happened. We're in a vastly transformed and constantly transforming industry in foreign news coverage. Uh, more of it is done by freelancers than ever before. The future probably lies in that direction still, even more. And increasingly, and this is something we hashed out a lot in the formulation of this document, uh, by local journalists who are not Western freelancers, and what protections do they get, which we don't address at length in here. That was one of our big points of contention we talked about. Um, so this is unprecedented and extraordinary. At the same time, this is only a beginning. This is just the first. This is the, the start of a process, not just to sort of a document and signatories. And there'll be more signatories and many more who are, as, as Vaughn was saying, a hair's breadth away from signing on now. Uh, we will see more signatories. And uh, even more important than the signatories, though, to this document uh, is the fact that there is a set of documents, there's a set of principles that are now public that all of us, whatever the news organization, whatever our status as a freelancer or a staffer, can point to and say, hey, have you read the principles? Whatever, even if you're on a contract, if you're a 25-year-old who's wandering through Somalia, who calls up some people and say, you know, I got some stuff, do you want to, you know, 
there is something you can all point to now. Uh, and I think that, that beginning of that process is even more important than this historic process itself. The fact that we will keep talking to one another and we will deepen and strengthen that network and that understanding which has never ever, ever been public before. Uh, yeah, I wanted to add to your original question of how this came about. Well, of course it was born from tragedy as, as David and uh, Charlie said, but there was also, when we, when we looked at the landscape of who's out there working now, uh, we see it's not always uh, long established organizations like AP Reuters and AFP. There's a lot of new uh, entrants to the international news coverage field, uh, new digital sites, uh, uh, new uh, groups of journalists, uh, and we thought that by sketching out some principles or, or rules of the road, it would help move all these new players uh, and, and move the established players to some kind of common understanding of what ought to be done. Good. Oh, well, I was just going to actually ask you, Charlie, um, to talk a little bit about how the landscape of threat has changed. I mean, today we had Reporters Without Borders put out their, their annual Press Freedom Index uh, showing declining figures, perhaps not surprisingly. We've had a brutal year. Um, and of course, 2015 didn't start off so well either. Uh, do you want to talk us through a little bit how, how the landscape's changed for both uh, freelancers and, and international freelancers and the local journalists upon whom so many reporters rely? Sure. And I would just, just to pick up on the, on the last points too, I, I think there's a real value to a moral commitment that's embedded in this document that's the start of that process. And, and I always say, as David pointed out, this is a living, breathing document. We want your input. Everyone in this room, we want you to get part of this process. It's going to be stronger uh, by the more people who come into this. And I think that's going to be critical. To answer your question, how has the landscape changed? I think we all know this, and this is a, a group that would understand this, but very quickly and very broadly, I would say, the threat um, has changed because of two major forces in our lives. And I think one is the internet uh, has changed the dynamic between journalists in the field and the people we cover. And the other big force in our lives, sadly, is uh, terrorism and is the threat that is very different than the way we've covered conflicts in the past. And I think when I covered, or all of us here at Dead, all these experiences, when we've all gone across checkpoints to talk to Hezbollah, or you crossed a checkpoint in Northern Ireland in Belfast to talk to someone who was representing the IRA, when you did that, you did that with the confidence they needed you. You were a messenger, you went across the line, and they needed you because they, whether you liked their, their methods and what they were all about didn't matter because they had an aspiration that was changing the landscape you were covering and therefore you needed to get at that and they would share it with you because they wanted that message out. Then you would go safely back across that checkpoint and you'd go back and you'd do your work. That's over. Uh, I think these organizations now have the web, they put the word out themselves, they don't need the messenger, and the relationship between messenger and organization you're covering is completely changed. You're putting yourself in great peril if you try to go get a comment from these guys now. And I think we all know that, it's very obvious, but it's a really big part of the change. And I think the other big change are the organizations themselves. I mean, what could be more uh, an embodiment of the darkness of the time we live in than ISIS? I mean, this is barbaric. This is beyond even anything we could have imagined five, ten years ago, I think. Uh, the cruelty they've shown, and, and I think it's a new landscape of peril that changes the calculus with everything. I think the other thing the internet has had a big impact on is the business, the models of how we're going to pay for good journalism in the field. The web has disrupted those models. Again, we all know this, but it's disrupted it in a way that big newspapers like the one I worked for for many years, Boston Globe, no longer have foreign coverage. I was their foreign correspondent for more than a decade. It was a great job. I loved it. Part of starting Global Post for me was because that was dying out. Those big, great newspapers, Philadelphia Inquirer, LA Times, Baltimore Sun, Chicago Tribune, Boston Globe, they all folded their foreign bureaus. That's how Global Post started. And we started with a confederacy of freelancers who wanted to still go out and do that work. 
But that now has taken on a sort of much more sweeping, um, I would say, and dramatic change to the industry where now freelancers are increasingly what we rely on. And so Internet's had these, these two very different but very related changes. And this document intends to confront that head on and find ways to deal with the peril and the fact that many of the people facing that peril will be freelancers. And as you pointed out, Marcus, local journalists who for way too long we haven't been sure we have real codes and moral responsibilities. Everyone who's worked in the field may have had their own individual one or worked for a good news organization that made sure people were taken care of. And every news organization here has done that. Um, but we all need to be reminded of how important they are. So that's the purpose of the document. Okay, so there are two things I'm going to pick up. But first of all, Vaughan, um, the one of the things that the document tries to do is also to talk about the responsibilities of freelancers. Can you talk a little bit about that? What what freelance uh, the frontline freelance registry members, for instance, have committed to by by signing this document, and what those practices actually mean? Um, if we go to, to answer this, I'm going to go back to the beginning of this whole process. Uh, FFR, the the frontline freelance register. Um, has its own documentation of this stuff and had it, pre-had it before. We have already written a, a code of practice, uh, which we think is the, the best one, by the way, because it's ours, um, but, but also um, because it includes, it goes much further than this one. This document, is important to understand, deals with about half uh, in terms of types of freelance activity. There's a whole area, which is a really complex area, of on-spec work where this document does not touch on um, and will be much more challenging to deal with. Um, quite a few people in the industry don't even realize uh, the extent of what freelancers do because their organizations have particular relationships with freelancers. They don't realize that other organizations uh, have different ones. And part of the problem with a gathering like this is you end up with the people who've helped make this work are invariably the more, you know, amongst the more responsible uh, of the uh, people from the industry that we end up dealing with. Um, and, and they often don't realize what the rest of the industry is really up to. Um, and uh, what I really want to talk about, and forgive me for, for not answering your question, um, <coughs> is uh, what, I want to talk about what we didn't get in this document, um, because it's important. Um, and uh, the one thing we didn't get in that we wanted was the fact that we'd like to be paid as freelancers within a given reasonable period of time. The truth of the matter is, even large responsible organizations can pay freelancers after 100 days or maybe 200. Um, and you often have a situation where freelancers are having to stump up their own costs and they don't get paid that for months as well. So uh, one of the issues we have as freelancers, and uh, it's something that people do not talk about, the industry doesn't talk about it enough, and we would like to keep talking about it because it needs resolution, is pay. Um, we are mostly paid abominably for the work we do, and it isn't right, it isn't acceptable. There's a massive moral argument here, and I would like you know, every decent journalist to know what their organization is actually paying the freelancers that it engages, because I think they'd be horrified if they knew. Um, anyway, um, I'd also like to pop in, if I could, the fact that I've just heard on my uh, computer thing uh, that uh, The Guardian have just signed up as well, which is rather good news. Oh. So we've got the BBC and The Guardian from Britain, um, which I think is, 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 is pretty good so far, and there are lots more that we're going to get as well. Um, uh, uh, what was your question? I might try and answer it. <laughs> No, it's about what freelancers are committing to do as well. Oh, yes, because because important. To... Well, look, ultimately, the, those commitments that are in the document are very similar to the ones that we, we insist that anybody who signs up to our register. And, and the, the register is a, is a term I think people aren't quite as familiar with over here as, as in, in Britain. Um, it's simply a list. It's a list of people. Um, it's not really a union, but it is a representative body. And we've got 500 members, which is very significant. Um, but um, so... Uh, I think what people don't understand about freelancers is we mentor each other, we work together, we can talk to each other rather more easily than the industry can talk to itself, oddly. Um, it's just part of our, 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 our makeup. Um, and in a sense, we're not afraid of um, uh, having to do things uh, professionally. Um, at FFR, to become a member of FFR, you have to declare yourself as professional. It's very much part of the process. You have to subscribe to a, a set of ethics uh, and a code of practice, uh, as, as I've described. And uh, this stuff's included in that. Um, it's, it's basic professional behavior. And as a professional workforce, we'd like professional pay. 
But you should talk about freelancers who might not want to sign on either. Yes, uh, uh, look, um, they're, 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 well, where I touch it on seven, I tried to use it on seven, and I had great respect for any freelancer. I think they should publicly declare if they disagree with it. It's very important. Um, uh, we uh, do not represent all freelancers. We represent those freelancers on the register. Um, and um, I think it is important uh, that, that, you know, we've signed this just. We didn't get everything we wanted out of it. But, I mean, it's important to say that, that you know, it does ask uh, freelancers to take appropriate training, particularly in, in difficult, dangerous environments. Um, it does mention pay. It does yeah. remind news organizations that preparing yourself properly to go into a dangerous uh, or difficult place is expensive. And that should well, be reflected you see, in, uh, in pay levels. One has to remember that what's really happened here, if one stands back from this, is there are a lot of good people in this industry who care about uh, the welfare of freelancers, and they genuinely do, and they want to see that improved. But the problem is, you can't want us to do stuff um, when uh, we're being paid so poorly. Um, because, and, and the fact that what we as an organization want to achieve is we want people to realize that poor pay is our biggest safety and welfare problem. Safety problem. If you don't get paid properly, you can't afford the safety, you can't afford the equipment, you can't afford the courses. And in the past, we've got some of this stuff through charitable means, and we've been very grateful, um, and we wouldn't want that to stop. But what we don't want is to still be receiving charity instead of a fair wage in five years' time or ten years' time, because we have been getting it that. That's what's been happening for the last 25, which is how long I've been doing it. Can I yeah. just follow on that for a sec? Um, I would say, you know, we, we all know, um, David is from Reuters, we know what Reuters is, Marcus, New York Times, we know the New York Times, and John is AP, we know AP, and you've been introduced to the to Vaughn, and I, truth be told, I am also on the board of trustees for Frontline, I, I believe deeply in Vaughn's mission, I believe deeply in the uh, freelance registry, We, in, but I wanted to share with you just for a minute about, I think Ground Truth has this position in between uh, being an advocate for freelancers, as Vaughn is, very strongly and convincingly, and being a publishing organization. I just, just for one minute, I want to share it because particularly for those of you who are students and who might be out in the world, I think it could be instructive to know that the Ground Truth Project, we, it takes its name from this document. The Ground Truth Field Guide was written in 2008 when I co-founded Global Post. And the Ground Truth Field Guide was an intention from day one of Global Post to share standards and practices and to really try to codify that in our community. Jim Foley had a lot of great training. Jim Foley had first aid training. Jim Foley had hostile environment training. But I do think there were a lot of lessons we need to learn about, about going forward that we can do better. And I know we can. So that's why I started the Ground Truth Project and what we do there is try to train and mentor the next generation of foreign correspondents by giving them resources they need to do big projects, things that they might not get to do as a freelancer doing sort of one-off, quick hits, hustling, as Vaughn has pointed out, for too little pay. How could we create a funding pool to do some aspirational work, to really reach, really try to get you to, to do this kind of work, and then to be surrounded by mentors and people who will teach you to do it safely? and give you the kind of editing and the kind of, I don't know, just practical experience of people who've been in these places before. So I just want to put that out because we've decided in our field guide to now put the call, as I call it, this is a really poorly named document, a call to global safety standards and principles. I don't know where our headline writers were, but definitely <laughs> it's a mouthful. And I think I'm just calling it the call. And we put the call embedded into this document, and we're putting it up online today. You can get it at thegroundtruthproject.org, and it's really a place just where you can download, first of all, the principles, of course, but also just sort of our own sense of guidelines. And I, I also want to say we do essays um, about lessons learned in the field. David Rode wrote a beautiful one, really important uh, essay about kidnap and ransom and a need for a rationalized policy. Gary Knight of Seven Photo, who's our visual editor, wrote a really important essay about freelancing and defending it fiercely, by the way, defending the freedom of it and the independence of it. Um, and James Foley wrote an essay that is amazing. Um, before he went to Syria, he sat down with me on the train to Tim Hetherington's funeral. And he sat and wrote out the lessons he learned 
when he was captured in Libya first and then released. And I think equally importantly, he shared his passion for why he wants to do this work and why he wants to be there. So I really want to encourage you to check this document out. I think there's a lot this community that's interested in this can learn from it. And it's totally all yours. If you want to use it, use it. It's free and it's out there and we want you to engage with it. Well, and those resources will be available. One of the things that this group is trying to do is actually gather the resources that are available uh, for freelancers and put them in one place. But David, you wanted to follow up. Just on, on a quick, uh, there is a sort of separate um, effort that's coming out of the guidelines to create a network of organizations to support freelancers. So, uh, you know, there's a great program run by Reporters Without Borders that provides insurance. There's some great safety training by uh, Rory Peck. Um, the DART Center offers, you know, counseling. Can you know those organizations work together, kind of rationalize their efforts to create a network that will help freelancers get, you know, the, the support and training they need, and Vaughn can keep working on pay. And that's and, a big focus but, of the next panel. Right? But I would also add to that um, the journalists in distress network because I don't want to lose sight completely of the fact that this also speaks to local journalists, mm -hmm. and the most threats around the world actually are directed at local journalists and not necessarily in conflict areas, but because of the work they do. Um, so I want to make sure that we don't forget that. And in the same, I also want to make sure we remember that that network, and the next panel will talk about it, also is for the industry. Whether you're established, like our news organizations, or whether you're a new player, and you know, now you have foreign correspondents sending you dispatches from the field, and you've never had that before, and you know anything about that, but you do it, uh, it's for all of us because we need to understand best practices too. And as the industry evolves and grows and we and these new organizations employ uh, more freelancers who are increasingly younger and without experience, we all need to understand the best practices here. We all have to help one another. So to some extent, I think, whenever you're talking, this is just you know, my old Marxist you know, theories, uh, we're talking about you know, uh, the, those who have the means and those who are you know, providing the work. But it doesn't have to be as adversarial as, as it has been, and we all have to deal in this new world together. And none of us will survive in it if we do not deal with it together. John, I'm going to give you the last word. I think uh, in putting together these uh, standards and principles, none of us were naive or thought they would solve all the problems. And as you've heard, even some people who were wonderfully prepared and experienced uh, uh, suffered um, and uh, were killed. And, um, but our hope is to move the needle a little bit in the direction of what Vaughn mentioned, uh, professionalization, and uh, a little bit in the direction of what uh, we all believe in, which is making a, a better partnership uh, among uh, news organizations, uh, journalist organizations, advocacy groups, to be mindful of the dangers and to be mindful before the work is done of what steps we can take to minimize the danger. Well, thank you all for participating and I want to encourage you to stay for the next panel which will go into more detail about the different aspects of the, of the guidelines. So thank you. Thank you. panel make your way up. Uh, we'll take questions. We'll have a conversation, really, with all of you after the second panel. We just want to have a lot of people and wanted to move the conversation along. While other folks come up, I just wanted to make a couple of points. First of all, I would urge you, all of you, to read these documents, this, the, the call, through. And really note the extraordinary responsibilities that have been embraced by the freelance community and by news organizations alike. I've seen in the deaths of, of James Foley and Kenji Goto and Stephen Sotloff and so many others, what we are seeing in the assassinations of local journalists around the world, both freelance and employed, really is a race to the bottom in press freedom. And it's only through efforts like this, identifying particular constituencies and taking concrete action instead of simply hand-wringing, concrete action to raise the floor, that we really raise the floor on all journalists' rights. This is actually, I believe, 
a central freedom of the press project. It's not just about the relatively small number of international conflict freelancers or the somewhat larger number, significantly larger number of uh, freelance journalists who live permanently in crisis areas. This conversation tonight is about all of that. Um, panel, let me just introduce the panel first of all from uh, left to right. Uh, Nicole Tung, who is a uh, independent photojournalist, freelancer, and also on the board of Frontline Freelance Register. Uh, Rob Mahoney, who is the deputy director of the Committee to Protect Journalists, uh, one of the great champions for all of us in this room and beyond. Uh, my Columbia colleague, Judith Matloff, who is a distinguished freelance uh, crisis correspondent who's worked everywhere from Mexico to Moscow, and also um, leads here at the school one of the various efforts around the world to address freelance safety, a uh, four-day crisis reporting preparation course for freelancers, uh, about which Brief ad, there's a flyer on the back along with the call and along with the press release for this event. Um, and Steve Adler, who is the editor in chief of Reuters. What we have here is the full spectrum of the changing media landscape from news executives in more than century old companies to freelancers to folks involved in nonprofit advocacy who now have moved in new directions because of changing uh, developments in the world. This is a wide-ranging effort. Um, Steve, I'm going to start with you. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised with the alacrity and speed with which Reuters, like the AP, you know, signed on to these principles. I, I will confess uh, that when we were having these conversations in our little drafters group, I kept saying, let's get individuals. Don't bother with the big news organizations. The lawyers are going to be all over this. What led Reuters to move so decisively to support these standards? And what challenges are they going to bring for your company? Um, I wish I had a better answer, but the answer really is the guidelines are so similar to our pre-existing internal guidelines that it didn't really require us to do anything radically differently. So there were a few things in the draft I think I'll this, uh, of the guidelines that we had issues with, but what ultimately uh, resulted is, is actually virtually identical uh, to our internal guidelines. Our, uh, in our internal guidelines, which we don't share publicly but are for our staff, um, but the preamble is the physical and emotional well-being of a full-time stringer is as important to Reuters as the physical and emotional well-being of a staff journalist. And then it goes through all the things we do, through hostile environment training, um, through going um, uh, through the whole process of providing safety equipment, providing insurance, um, all the things we do uh, for, um, for our staff journalists, we, we would do for journalists with whom we have a relationship. And that, you know, the, the fact is we've got several hundred journalists who are not on staff, uh, who are in places like Syria and Iraq and Libya and all over the world, um, who are not on staff, but for various reasons are spending you know, a, a pretty significant amount of time working with us. And, and we're committed to providing the same protections uh, to them that we provide to our staffers. Sometimes it's more complicated. So for example, um, because most of our freelancers are local journalists, um, if you're in a place, and I, again, for safety reasons, I won't name the place, but if you're in a place where you can't actually go in to the place safely to provide hostile environment training, we actually go to enormous expense and difficulty to get them out of the country to provide hostile environment training someplace else. So we, we were very comfortable with these, um, you know, very strongly supportive of them, um, and also believe it's a really good sign that all these organizations want to work together uh, to, to, uh, to, put, to do this. Let, but let me push you gently, or maybe not so gently. Um, a freelance photographer I know emailed today and said, sounds great, but really these are going to, in a, in a practical sense, do more to make the editors and executives on the desk feel better than they will to, in any practical way, change the relationship between freelancers and, and, and employers. How do you see the, the relationship evolving and where do guidelines like this fit in? Well, I, I think the relationship is evolving, at least for us, towards taking full responsibility for freelancers. And the fact is, if a freelancer who we're working with, with any kind of regularity, something bad happens to them, uh, as a news organization, you kind of have to make a choice. And so you learn about this over time. So you learn that 
you know, realistically, um, it's, it's not helpful or useful or effective to start parsing what the differences are between an employee and a non-employee. Essentially, um, you need to make the commitment when you develop the relationship. So the hard part, to me, is not what's actually covered, as, as one of the panelists said, but what's not covered. The hard part for a big news organization like ours, and AFP has dealt with it a little differently than we have, is what do you do with somebody who brings you something? Um, and you don't have a relationship with them, but, you know, hey, it's really good. And, and that's what we grapple hardest with. That's the hardest issue for us, is do you have a blanket rule, as a AFP says it does, that you don't accept anything if you haven't previously assigned it and solicited it? Or do you have a more flexible rule that says, well, if it's highly newsworthy, uh, you have to make kind of a balance test. You have to decide whether or not to take it. So what our basic philosophy on that is, if it's hugely newsworthy, because our first obligation is to the public to, to be witness to what's going on in the world, we're, we're likely to use it if we've authenticated it and we, and we think it's newsworthy and true. But then our, our rules say what you then do is you have to go interview that freelancer and you have to make a sort of a forward-looking decision as to whether you want to work with that person. And I know of a, of a recent case where we took the work we interviewed the person and we decided this person didn't have the professional standards, they were too closely aligned to one side or the other in a conflict, and so we made an affirmative decision not to take their work. So, so to me the harder issues are kind of at the boundaries of this document. What's in the document I think is very doable and we're committed to doing it. Judith, you've been variously reporting, educating, and campaigning on the freelance safety issue for a very long time. Where do you see these documents fitting into the evolving picture, and where do we go from here, do you think? Um, okay, I used to be a bureau chief and sending people to places like um, Rwanda and Chechnya, and I wish there had been a document like this then, from a manager's point of view, because you you don't Oh, we, you, you need to know what sort of resources you need and you need to know how to evaluate the staff you have and what risks you should take with them. Now that was 20 years ago. Um, and now I'm on the other side of it. I'm a freelance reporter and writer and I'm dealing with editors who are very much in the same position that I was in 20 years ago. They don't know the right sort of questions to ask. I think this is incredibly important because if you can provide people information and educate them, they'll act in a more, um, a more appropriate and engaged and responsible way. And I, I, think, I think what Marcus said before is, is a point I want to touch upon. We shouldn't see it as an adversarial relationship of all those exploitative employers or those irresponsible reporters. I think quite the, um, quite the contrary. I think it's just a lack of education. People don't know what resources are out there and they don't know the questions to ask. So when I go on an assignment, let's say, to a place like Dagestan, and my editor doesn't ask me, what are your contingency plans? It's not because the editor is evil. The editor doesn't know to ask that because the editor has never been to a place like Dagestan. So I see this as a highly, highly constructive um, movement forward. And you know, I also want to point out that when I started out doing this stuff 30 years ago, like your editor gave you a bottle of scotch and said, good luck. You know, and it, we've moved on since then. Like, we talk about trauma now. Like, in those days, people had what is now known as post-traumatic stress syndrome, and nobody knew what it was. You didn't have a name for it. Just every, he was fucked up. That's what you'd say. Well, now, you know, we've been educated thanks to DART. We know what trauma is, and we know to recommend certain counselors for people or recommend, you know, maybe they take two weeks off. Likewise, when I started out, you didn't wear flak jackets. Nobody had a flak jacket. Nobody had a bulletproof car. That came in next. So I see this as the next stage of evolution. And how you've been training people for a long time. You're the only really sort of trainer on, on our panel tonight. How is training itself for freelancers changing? When th this document is going into a world of hostile environments, companies, of educational institutions, of corporations, some of whom provide their, have their own academies, like the BBC, which signed this document, has its own academy. Reuters has, and, and Reuters educates through its own trust as well. How, it, how is what freelancers need to know about safety changing? Um, well, there's a, there's a new thinking in, among certain safety 
educators that we should really move away from the hostile environment training. First of all, it's grotesquely expensive. It's like $5,000 a week. No freelancer can afford that, and very few employers are going to spring that kind of money. And I think there's other types of training you can do that are just as valuable, but don't involve going out into the field and having somebody throw a sack over your head. I think you know there's a movement now more towards how to evaluate risk in making decisions. And you don't have to go to some field somewhere to learn that. You can sit in a classroom and study case studies and look at what kind of mistakes were made and what we can learn from that. So I think there is a, a, a certain, and that's much more economical for the freelancers themselves and also for the, the employers who may be paying for it. And I think, you know, we have to be realistic. There's also, you know, I, I, there are different levels of different modules. You know, we're, we're now, now sexual assault and setting boundaries with that is a, is a new module that wasn't really around five years ago. Cybersecurity is critical now. I think five years ago very few people offered that. Um, but you know, it, I think the key if for those of you who are freelancers is don't look at the curriculum, look at the trainer. There are some phenomenal trainers, for instance, the person who does medical training for risk who we also use. She's by far, I think, one of the best health emergency battlefield trainers there are. So, you know, talk to people, those of you who are freelancers or employers. Talk to your colleagues, you know, find out what really has worked and not, and then take it from there. But, you know, I, I would tend to move away from military-based training because they're not journalists. They don't teach you uh, decision-making. And I think you, you're much better off seeking training from people who are journalists in the field who understand what the decision-making process is like. And I, I think we also should acknowledge uh, the rise of first aid training and reporters instructed in saving colleagues, risk, uh, who uh, Lily at least is here, uh, yes, but also a, a particular evolution in journalism training. And to students in the room, I would say one of the interesting things I've learned from psychologist colleagues with whom the Dart Center for Journalism and Trauma works with is that training of any kind increases your overall psychological resilience and good judgment. So when you take first aid training or digital security training or, or crisis management training, hostile environments training, you're not only getting situation specific skills that may save your life, you're also developing a set of instincts, responses, and capacities that will help you in all kinds of situations. Uh, it's a really multi-level thing. Rob, CPJ, you know, has been on this this beat forever. Where do you see these guidelines fitting into the history of journalism protection, and where do you think it needs to go? Very quickly, the backdrop against this, because this movement for uh, better uh, guidelines has been going on for a while. We've just come. We are living through the three deadliest years for journalists. So more journalists have been killed in the last three years than CPJ has been keeping records for, which is the last 30 years. And even 2015 has gotten off to a terrible start with 16 journalists already killed in the month of January alone. So that's the backdrop against this. Um, we think this is a, an incredibly important document, but it's, it's only a start. Uh, I think we have to be careful not to treat freelancers as a monolithic group. There are lots of different groups of freelancers. There are lots of different groups of journalists who are working around the world who aren't uh, on full-time staff. Um, this will serve, I hope, as a pointer to uh, other journalist groups who don't just belong to the Frontline Freelance Register, as important as they are. Um, for them to point to, to their regional associations, employers, whether it's in Pakistan or in Mexico, and say, look, here's some standards. Uh, that, that we can work with this and maybe adapt it to our own our own use. So I think that's that's one of the, the very important uh, elements and, that out of this. And I should say, in the last 24 hours, I at least have gotten some strong interest in these guidelines from Sri Lanka and the Philippines. I do think there's going to be global impact. Uh, but where do you think this campaign needs? If, if this becomes kind of a campaign to raise the floor and freelance safety, what issues? Where does it need to go, strategically and against? Well, the issue, uh, the issue of, of pay it has been raised, and I think that that's an important element, and we can't, uh, we can't uh, avoid that, because I think that a lot of journalists will take care of their own security and safety if they are adequately recom uh, recompensed for it. I think also, um, strategically, we need to look at, at, at several areas. One is, is training and safety with Judith has gone on, but the other one is to prevail 
upon governments around the world that are killing journalists for uh, uh, to, to tackle the problem of impunity. That there are so many countries where journalists' lives are, are snuffed out for a few hundred bucks, uh, you can get someone killed. And that is a huge issue for local journalists. Nicole, um, I've saved you for last because you are the voice of the freelancer the, on this panel, one of the voices of freelancers. Um, you've come into this business at a time of great risk and danger to freelancers around the world, and indeed a time of great chaos in regions like the Mideast and in our own <laughs> sort of political system. Um, how do these guide, what do these guidelines mean to you, first as a journalist and then as an as an activist on behalf of frontline freelance writers and so on. Um, yeah, I think for me personally as a journalist, uh, the guidelines are a, a really wonderful start. There's actually communication between the freelancers and the publications to which we contribute. Um, and this is really unprecedented. Um, it's something that in 2011 when I was strolling into Libya across the border um, had you know just no concept of in terms of um, am I going to be safe? What am I going to do? I was lucky enough to be with veteran reporters and uh, people with you know Human Rights Watch who looked out for me. So um, that's sort of how I understood oh yeah there are things that I should probably adhere to and I took it seriously enough um, you know to and to stick around long enough to understand well you know, this is, uh, there are more and more freelancers. Uh, this is just the changing nature of, of the industry. Um, but I also feel like it it's easy to see, you know, freelancers en masse and to see them as, you know, somewhat uh, scattered and sometimes irresponsible because of a few bad apples in, in the cart. Um, but, you know, for the most part, many of us, and not just those in the frontline freelance registry, want to take responsibility for our own actions and the people, especially we work with, and, the, and you know, the local journalists, the fixers, and people that help us and enable us to tell those stories. Um, but I do feel, you know, and this document is a, is a wonderful start. It really does recognize our responsibilities as freelancers, which is absolutely necessary because we have to put it out there, and the responsibilities of the, uh, of the outlets that we work for. Um, and again, I'm going to keep harping about the pay. Um, you know, somehow we need to find a, a better model to, to pay the freelancers uh, better because that does equate um, how we calculate safety. You know, if instead of hailing a cab in a, kind of a, in a conflict zone, maybe we could actually afford hiring a full-time driver that we know and trust and will take us safely to a place and make you know, safety calculations with us. Um, that accounts for a lot. Um, and obviously, you know, we're talking a lot about trying to streamline the resources that are already available in this industry. Um, you know, everybody from Reporters Without Borders to the Rory Peck Trust, Risk, and all the other training groups and media advocacy groups, streamlining uh, these resources to make them readily available quickly to, the, you know, not just the international journalists, but, but the local journalists. Because sometimes, you know, when you're new to this industry, you don't know where to turn to. Um, you know, I had to deal with a lot kind of psychologically uh, from Libya and losing friends, etc. But it's, you just don't know where to turn. And I think that having a streamlined set of resources is really essential as well to enabling. Let me work. push you in, in kind of the freelance equivalent of the way I pushed Steve. Um, I know for a lot of people in this room, there, there has been real concern at the, um, at the number of very experienced, untrained um, freelancers, and in some cases more war tourists than freelancers, who have put themselves and colleagues at risk. It's relatively easy to talk about these important principles here in New York City and the safety of Columbia University. It's another thing when you are in Beirut or, or Istanbul or Donetsk, uh, sitting around the bar, sitting around the table, with a bunch of colleagues, some of whom may be responsible and well-trained, some of whom may not. Where do these guidelines and the broader campaign that, of which this is a part, how do we address that problem? Maybe where, does, where do organizations like Frontline Freelance fit in, but where do, also do you as, as a journalist activist fit into that? Because it's not easy. In terms of adhering to well, raise the floor on safety and either by pulling these out of your pocket or 
which would be so broader, unromantic. Right, the broader campaign of which, <laughs> which this is a part. What, how, how are we going to do, really, how yeah. are we going to address this? Um, I really think, it, and, and Vaughn addressed this earlier, uh, freelancers do talk to each other. You know, it's so much easier for us to communicate with each other. Um, f you know, FFR is just one of a representation of many um, freelancers out there, but, you know, we do encourage each other um, and by word of mouth talk about different groups and funding for training, etc., um, and encouraging each other to adhere to those codes. And obviously there will be people who, are, you know, kind of do go off and do their own thing. Um, but that's what we as FFR are trying to do, address the issues of international journalists first, which is, um, you know, it's just trying to get everybody together in one room to basically say, we, as you know, a group of freelancers, have to adhere to these code of conducts, or else we're not going to be taken seriously. Um, but as I think, I, I don't know, an advocate for the freelancers, I would probably have to say that you know, this is. It, there's always going to be a few bad apples, and we, you know, we don't. We we hope that that can try to try to be addressed. Um, but I think this is a is a start, and for us to be able to say, uh, you know. We need training. We need to have better standards. Um, that, that's how we're going to operate, and that's how the news organizations are going to take us seriously. Now, let me ask you just one last thing, because you're a photographer. And we've heard several times that not all freelancers are the same. Photographers are a particular tribe. What do you think the safety issues connected to photography and the sort of the baseline issues are connected to photographers that may differ a bit from people? Or typing on a keyboard or doing other sorts of journalism these days. Not that we are, or everybody's doing everything, but you are principally a photographer. Yeah, I mean, if we want to talk about really the being on the front lines, um, I would say that the photographers often get the closest, you know, because we have to be there to get that bang bang picture or, you know, a very intimate close image um, to make that connection to the outside world who are viewing our images. Um, I think obviously inherently we put ourselves at more danger as visual journalists do video or photography. This is like a town meeting in which we are collecting questions and feedback on these guidelines to help not only perhaps amend them and evolve them, but think about where we go from here. We heard questions about cultural, cultural risk and other kinds of risks, questions of gender. You know, and so on. Questions about the accessibility of training available, all kinds of things. That's part of the conversation going forward. Um, we can keep talking informally in the room, but I want to thank everyone on the panel. There is, it's an incredibly courageous group of people. Um, thank all of you. Uh, and for those of you who want, A, there are copies of the guidelines uh, and the press release. B, the guidelines are live now. They should be anyway on the Guard Center website and others. Thanks all.